Hey, punk, I'm talking here. Go ahead. Make my day. Hey folks, Steve Rizzo here, and welcome to Hey, I'm Talking Here. This is a show about empowerment. This is a show that will take you to a better place personally and professionally. And this show is brought to you by The Bob Project. And I know some of you may be wondering who Bob is. You're going to find that out a little bit later on in the show. But right now, I just want to introduce you uh, to my team, my crew, my cast, um, whatever you want to call them. Uh, first and foremost, my director, my producer, and my tech guy. And just so you know, if something ever goes wrong, it's always his fault. Always. We have experienced that already. <laughs> Let me welcome Mr. Enthusiasm himself, Bruce. How you doing, Bruce? Good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. See, a man of very few words. You just ask him a question and he'll answer it. And uh, we also have the words. lovely Kellen Ann. Kellen, where are you? I'm right here. There you are. <laughs> I'm here. What do, you, what do you have for your name? I'm talking here too. Because <laughs> sometimes you let me talk. Sometimes. It, yeah. it depends. You know what I'm saying? Depends on the mood I'm in. I'm a very gracious person. I really. I, hey, good morning, Mark Benner. Good morning to you. And Dan Greenan, my cousin, good morning to you. A lot of people saying good morning already. We already have people. I know. Are you as wonderful. excited as I am about today's show? Uh, we got a great show. Uh, we really do. And uh, Pat Hazel will be on the show uh, very soon. And um, yeah, it's going to be real exciting. I'm super yeah. excited. Yes, you are. What hat are you wearing? What are you wearing? My Bucky's hat. Oh, you got oh, Bucky's. Yeah, I heard all about Bucky's. I get it. Bucky's. I get it. We're looking yeah. for sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> and before we, before we introduce Pat, uh, right now, it's time for the Rizzo Memo segment of the day. The Rizzo Memo. Memo. <laughs> this, hot off the presses, new news memo. Did you know that studies have shown that people who make a conscious choice every day to enjoy themselves during the process of whatever it is they're trying to achieve are more creative, more productive, able to bounce back a lot faster from life's challenges and find solutions to problems a lot quicker. But the greatest benefit of enjoying the process, folks, is that it generates a massive amount of positive energy. You want to know what that energy is called? It's called passion and enthusiasm. And both are very contagious and both are pathways towards creativity and success. Why? Because they derive from your higher nature. As a matter of fact, the word enthusiasm comes from the Greek word enthos, meaning the God within. It comes down to this. The unexpected is always waiting for you on any given day. Countless outside factors can either make or ruin your day, foil your goals and dreams, and stifle creativity. So to me, it just makes sense to seize control of what you can. And whether you, throughout the course of a day, whether you're in like a, an up or a down mood, always remind yourself constantly that true happiness and inner peace is your number one priority. Your attitude throughout the day evolves around that. And blessing the things that life has given you rather than cursing what life is currently throwing at you puts you on that path to happiness and, and the ability to enjoy the day. So when times are tough, you need to understand that it's really the passion and enthusiasm that pushes you to go that extra mile. It's passion and enthusiasm that propel you into a zone where you feel confident, courageous, and victorious. Failure is not an option, and every mistake is viewed as a do-over. So when something doesn't turn out the way that you want or the way that it's planned, you don't even consider defeat. You're in such a high state of mind that you're saying to yourself, okay, all right, wait a minute, that didn't work, but I know I can turn this around. Who can I go to that can help me with this? I know that there is something within me that can meet this challenge head on, and I'm going for it. And I will leave you with this. When you hold on to your vision with passion and enthusiasm, you will access you will access a higher uh, guidance system, which will lead you to a pathway of new circumstances, opportunities, and serendipitous events. So you really have to do whatever it takes to make sure that that flame of passion and enthusiasm is always burning. And if you do, I promise 
that you will come to know what truly creative, successful, and happy people have come to know. That passion and enthusiasm are forces that will always, always, always take you to a better place. And that's the, uh, that's the Rizzo memo for the day, for this day. It'll come on again the next show. And um, Kellen, where are you? <laughs> there she is. It's a beautiful thing. I love <laughs> what you just said. And I could probably come up with a hundred examples, you know, just in everyday life. You know, the whole, the whole process thing was a big topic during COVID because yeah. a lot of people like me learned to stop and smell the roses and enjoy the process. And in that, I just happened to be listening to our guest's podcast uh -huh. and he, he said a couple of things. Um, a lot of time it's important to balance, you know, giving space and direction. Direction is you go online. He, he, his, his guest was Austin Cleon. And he talks about how when we go to Google or we give a news feed and things are like pushed in our face, but we need to learn to give ourselves space. And, and that would be then. And then he also said that that's an integral part to enjoying the process. And I found that to tie in really well with what we were talking today. Does that make sense? Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it was and, awesome. And, you know, it was a great podcast. No, no, I that, yeah, I and I totally agree. And it's exactly what it is. What this whole particular segment show is about mm -hmm. is about enjoying the process. But uh, uh, unfortunately, today, especially in the past two years with the pandemic, enjoyment is something that people are leaving by the wayside especially those who are trying to revamp their business or trying to readjust their family life and trying to get to that next step in life and things aren't going the way that they want, that's when the stress level gets a little too intense, self-doubt, overwhelm, fear, anger, and a host of other negative emotions come into play. And without people realizing what they're doing to themselves, enjoyment becomes secondary mm -hmm. at a time when it's most primary. And, and I would wager any amount of money that most people, um, not just the people that are tuning in today, but people in general, when they're writing out their plans and their goals and dreams for the future, short term, long term, um, nowhere on those lists do they ever include enjoying themselves. And that mm -hmm. totally, totally blows me away. It and, does. And, and, Kel and Kellen, you know what they do instead? They create dangerous mindsets and they're not aware that they're doing it. And they say things like this to themselves on an unconscious level. They're saying, you know what? I'll enjoy myself when I achieve the goal. I'll enjoy myself when I get to where I want to go. Right now, there are too many changes taking place, too many things happening in my life. When things calm down and things start going the way I want them to go, and when I get the respect and appreciation that I deserve, that's when I'm going to enjoy myself. And I'm not going to do it one minute sooner. I'll show me a thing or two. That's and us being directed instead yeah. of giving ourselves space. Exactly. And by give me, I mean, I changed my whole life by giving myself space. I moved 2,200 miles away. I bought a house. I'm I'm living my dream with work. You know, it's just it's amazing. It's and it's so important to give yourself the space and to play. And you know me, I am the queen of inner child, aren't I? Yes, yes, you are, and and which is why. But you're on the show with us all the time because I love your attitude. I love your your jovial way about you, and and um, and and people could learn from other people, can't they? Mm -hmm. By the way they respond to challenging situations, and I think that's one of the things that connected us. We both were going through the same crap with this pandemic, mm -hmm. but we never allowed to put our happiness on hold. And I think mm -hmm. we're both very aware of what happens when you get into that self curse talk. Some people call it negative self-talk. I call mm -hmm. it self-curse talk because you're really casting a spell on your life and on your creativity. And if you want to turn your life around, you can't put your happiness on hold. You right. can't. It's insane. And when you go on that banter, I'll be happy. I won't be happy until you're, you are putting happiness on hold. You're actually telling yourself that your happiness is dependent upon something that has to take place at some point in the future. Uh, that's insane. It's insane because it'll never happen. Happiness you, always be steps ahead of you. 
What do you say to people say, oh, it's easier said than done, Steve? Look, you know. Well, I say to them, anything in life is easier said than done, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. I think the key is you have to be aware when you are on that curse self-talk rampage uh, because nothing will keep you from enjoying the day, from enjoying the moment, then that. And once you become aware of what you're saying to yourself and what you're doing, it's that moment in awareness where you could say, I got to turn this around. I have, a, I have a whole day ahead of me. I want to continue writing my book. I got to meet with a client. I got a sales pitch. I got to get whatever it may be. I got to take care of the kids. It's my kid's, it's my kid's birthday today. I got to be in the right state of mind. And see, once you start asking yourself those questions in that state of awareness, you're opening up yourself to a whole other world of possibilities that you can choose from. And th I guess what I'm saying is that you can't fix something unless you know it's broken. Right. And it's in that, in that moment of awareness that, um, uh, um, that when that comes into play, you can choose other alternatives on how to respond to the crap that life is constantly throwing at you. And, um, I, I wonder what, what would Bob say? See, I was just going to say that. I think that's a, I think that's a perfect, uh, segue for the, the next segment, the word according to Bob segment. And Bruce, before you play it, let me, let me just give a little intro for this. Um, this is uh, the, the, the word according to Bob segment. And uh, the name of this particular segment is called uh, Enjoy the Process or Pay the Price. And folks, trust me when I say there is always a price to pay when you're putting your happiness on hold. And sometimes you might not be aware of it until 20 years later. And um, if there's ever such thing as committing a sin on yourself, I think it's that. Because that not only affects you. It affects your family, your fellow workers, and the, and, and, and the people you do business with. So, Bruce, let's just uh, play that segment, The Word According to Bob. Here's something I want you to consider, and I want you to use your imagination here. Let's say that your goal is to become a vice president of a big company. And after many years of intense stress, worry, and an avalanche of emotional, mental, and physical overload, you finally achieve your goal, along with all of the wealth and prestige that comes with it. Is this success? Now, if you were to consult a dictionary, the answer would be yes. Webster's Dictionary defines success as follows, the attainment of wealth, position, honors, or the like. I find it absolutely amazing that the words happy, happiness, joy, or enjoyment are not included in any definition of the word success. Unfortunately, our conventional definition of success is simply achieving a goal. No emphasis at all is placed on the value of experiencing and enjoying the journey, building character, or learning life's lessons along the way. Now here's a hypothetical question. What if someone were to show you a video of yourself as you climb the ladder to great success. Now in this video, you see yourself achieving all of your goals and obtaining great wealth. But during the entire process, however, you witness how you subjected your body, mind, and spirit to intense negative energy along the way. Not only were you unhappy most of the time, but you were able to see how your refusal to enjoy the process affected your family, your friends, associates, and your overall well-being. <sighs> Come on, you talk about a downer of a movie. Now I'm gonna ask you the question again. Is this success? Here's the answer, no, and here's why. And I really want you to get this. If the process of fulfilling your goal is polluted with negative energy and lack of enjoyment along the way, it can only create more unhappiness even when the goal is achieved. Why? Because the happiness that you feel in that moment of reaching success is a temporary state dictated by its conventional definition. You see, after the initial euphoria wears off, you're back in the same old negative place again because you've carried that same old negative mindset with you. All of those toxic emotions, the fear, the anger, the self-doubt, overwhelm, jealousy, all that stuff comes with you. The truth is, it really doesn't matter how much money you have or how famous you are or how many goals you've achieved. The bottom line is this, and only you know this. If you are not happy, you're not successful. 
And if you're not enjoying yourself on the journey towards your goal, you're ripping yourself off. And trust me when I say there are enough people out there willing to do that for you. There's absolutely no reason why you can't make a conscious choice right now at this moment, and it doesn't matter how old you are, to experience and enjoy yourself on the journey towards the goal. And if you do, you'll have a profound appreciation of how you earned it. And in my view, that's the ultimate success. And by the way, this isn't coming from a motivational speaker. This is coming from the heart of someone who learned this lesson the hard way. And that's the word, according to Bob. For those of you wondering who Bob is, uh, uh, Bob is God. And it's uh, the new book that'll be coming out soon. Uh, Conversations with Bob, a timeless, entertaining dialogue for living an extraordinary life, starring Bob and Bernie. Uh, Bernie is uh, lives in the negative zone. And he represents everybody on this planet, regardless of race, religion, social status, political point of view. Every one of us experiences Bernie's ups and downs in negative ways at some point throughout various stages of our lives. Bob is the antidote to to, uh, Bernie's incessive negativity. It's all dialogue. And uh, the book is about you have a choice to either listen to what your inner Bernie saying or you can listen to what your inner Bob says. Uh, it's entertaining and uh, it's pretty profound. And it took me eight, seven or eight years to to write. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. And it's time for me to introduce our special guest. Pat Hazel is a stand-up comedian and one of the original writers of NBC Seinfeld. It's a shame that show never made it. <laughs> He's a Tonight Show's veteran, a critically acclaimed playwright and contributed commentator to National Public Radio. And Pat is also the host for the very popular podcast, Creativity in Captivity. His 35 plus years as a writer, director, and producer have made him the go-to guy for custom theatrical entertainment. Folks, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pat Hazel. From his from his room. That's what it is nowadays. There's no studio. There's just a, everybody in their room. I call it my studio room. Yeah. Well, you guys are uh, up a live stream without a paddle there. You handled that very well, I yeah, think. Thanks. Yeah. It'll be exciting yeah. to watch that at the end. Yeah. You know what that comes from, Pat? You know as well as I do, being on stage. You know, when, when something just doesn't go right, you either fall down or you just stay where you are and you continue. <laughs> There's nothing to it. You know, we're all used to it at this point. Technology is always raising its ugly head at some point, but I think just handling it authentically is the best way to do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Pat, you know, um, I, I've heard your name so many times throughout the course of my career, and uh, we met a while back at, uh, I think it was National Speakers Association conference a few times. Um, uh, never had uh, a great deal of time to talk, but uh, your name is always buzzing around. And I, I think what, uh, how I related to you more than maybe most people is that we both made transitions in our lives uh, from stand-up comedy to, uh, uh, to what we do now today. And I, I think you might have gone through what I went through from my peers. Like, what the hell are you doing? Why, why are you doing this? You should, you know, what, what you're doing so well at what you're doing. And you were on the Tonight Show and you did this and you did that. And now you're doing this. But um, I believe that there was something in your heart that just guided you uh, to go in the direction that you knew you were going in. I, unaware on how it was going to end up, but... I always tell people, man, if, if it's in your heart, follow it. You can't go wrong, regardless of the ups and downs. So if, if, if you can, if you could tell us about the transformation you made from stand-up comedy to playwright to producer, director, and now hosting your own podcast, uh, I, explain that to the audience. Well, I, I can. It's funny. I don't look at it as um, necessarily transformational or uh, as a transition, but what became the clarity was I was coming into something. There was some fluidity. So there's a creative flow that I realized, oh, that's what I like about that. That's what, oh, being a stand-up comic is being creative with words and finding laughter and bringing joy to people. But this is another form of it. So 
it really was a subtraction art uh, each time looking at maybe where I was geographically or what age I was at and saying, oh, how can I apply my creative sense, my voice, my sense of humor to a new thing? So I never looked at it as sort of getting off one horse and getting on another. I just thought, oh, how am I going to ride this horse and where am I going to ride this horse now? So I'm not in the desert anymore. I'm in the mountains and now I'm crossing a stream. So I look at it as a little bit more fluid and each step of it made me more aware, for example, that I'm, that I was a producer, even when I was a kid doing magic tricks, even though I was practicing magic and doing comedy and learning to juggle, all of those were grooming me to be a better producer, solving problems, logistically writing a script, putting, figuring out what the costume is, where do the props go? All of that is producing in a way. And most people who are a one person show, whether that's a speaker or a comic or a songwriter, don't realize that they are using a lot of their producing skills to write the song, get it, get it recorded, do like each one of those is a logistical problem solving thing. So I feel like I had ahas along the way. And, and I'll definitely acknowledge that, that moving from stand up comedy and clubs to doing a one man show meant that I was moving into theaters and performing arts centers. That felt a little better. I didn't have to apologize for the act before me. I didn't have to worry about selling drinks. I was just concentrating on what, what it was I was, what I had to share. And that became, that started allowing my messaging to become clearer. Obviously this new podcast is focused very much on creativity and a creative process. And that, that was born from the pandemic taking all the venues away. So while I didn't have a venue, I thought, oh, subtract what do I have. I have a voice. What do I like most? I like talking to creative people. As a creative consultant for films and plays and other things, I thought, this is the part that gives me joy is being on the phone with a guy like you or someone else to say, how do we solve this problem? Well, how do we make something new and cool? And I thought, I don't have to stop doing that but maybe I could share it. Maybe I could be of service to people who would like to sit in on that conversation. And I feel like that's, if there's a gift to come out of this, it's that everything got put on pause. I would not have started a podcast. Uh, it's not something that I was in my wheelhouse, but now that I'm involved in it, I realize, oh, this is a really interesting medium, which is of my interest. So people who don't want to listen to this or talk about it, they're not going to tune in. But we're building a creative community of people who have other things to share. And I think maybe you've been on, uh, listened to a few things, but the disciplines are so different from an aerial choreographer to a ventriloquist to a filmmaker to, you know, a guy that is um, restoring dinosaurs for science and history museums. They don't seem to have a lot in common, but the common denominator is that they're all using that creative connection. They're exploring something they're passionate about. All the things that, that you talk about are really at the core, the courage to create. That's what it is. So, wow. uh, you know, it, it feels like to me, that's, a, that's where I feel at home. And over time, it's just finding closer to home. Where is that? And stand up, I really enjoy, still enjoy it when I get a chance. But I disguised it when I moved it into the theater. It's I'm still storytelling. I'm still getting laughs. It's just happening in a, in a theatrical environment. And then I started to realize, oh, I'm pretty good at writing it. I don't always have to be the performer. So putting in the form of dialogue and putting it in a play was another way of achieving that. And then it didn't always have to be my material. I thought, oh, as a director, maybe I can infuse humor or better storytelling by guiding someone. And that was in a long form in plays. But then when I started doing commercials, it was like, oh, this is just another story. And it has to be told in 60 seconds or 30 seconds or 15 seconds. So where's the laugh? Where's the heart? Where's the story? In, in a way, you still carry that toolkit with you no matter what you do. Yeah. 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 I, I love that, what you said. And I, what I find amazing, you know, as, as you get older, you start realizing how your life is just forming perfectly in full circle and the things that you once questioned like for example you know i was a i was a 
I was a teacher, an English teacher for two years, and I loved it. And I was a counselor for kids with behavioral problems, and I loved it. I, I just, I, I loved it. And then when I was getting into, uh, I, I, at night, I was making extra money as a stand-up on Long Island and in city clubs, and I started really delving into that. And then I started questioning myself, well, you're going to leave the teaching thing. You, you went to so many years of college to do that. Now you're doing this. And then I'm thinking, what? I, there was a point where I was thinking it was wasted time. Why did I do that? And then I became a stand-up comedian. And then from comedian, I became a motivational speaker. And then from there, I became an author and a writer. And then you realize at some point in your life, it was never a waste of time. You needed those. Those are the strategies and the tools that I use to do what I'm doing right now, the stand-up, the teaching. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm able to do the two things that I love. And plus something I never thought I would do is write books. So it's funny how life just comes in full circle. And those things that you once questioned, sometimes the answers don't come until 30 years later. 30 yeah, years later. And I think probably your listener is very much like us, right? There's somebody in pursuit of learning and growing and discovering. And I always just live life in anticipation that something cool is going to happen today. And it's my job to observe and find it. Where is it? And then when I find it, I go, is that it? Or is there something cooler coming this yeah. afternoon? You know, so it's definitely about living in the present and keeping that sense of wonder alive, which, you know, I've talked about in other shows that I do and so forth. But boy, imagine if you could make a guest list of all the cool people you wanted to talk to and you could spend an hour with them. That's what the captivity part of creativity and captivity was. It wasn't about being stuck in, in the pandemic. It was about holding a creative person captive and studying them for an hour and then letting them back into the wild, right? Wow. So, so I started at the top. I just went to the chief creative officer of Pixar and he gave me an hour of his time. I went to Frank Oz, who was Jim Henson's partner. I went to other people and I thought, oh, if I'm not working, they're not working. And we can, we can talk about how and why they do what they do. And that, I got to say selfishly, is a super cool creative seat to sit in is to send out these sort of curiosity dates and find out and learn from everybody. So I'm not the expert on it. I'm just facilitating a conversation and I try to do it as a conversation and not, not an interview because I don't, I feel like I want it to go in any direction they're interested in and less about finding out about what their history is. I feel like you can always look up Google somebody or look their resume up I always feel like hmm, I, if I had a chance to talk to somebody, I'd like to know why they did it. Yep. I'd like to know what their why is or how they do it. Or do you have a, a tip for me that can, you know, make life a little bit easier on, on your, you know, the experience you've had? Maybe you could tell me, you know. Well, well, that's what I like about your, your podcast, because you have high end people. Your guests are high end people. But the message is for everyone. Uh, they just have a different story to tell. But, you know, they're just letting people know that, you know, there's a there's a creative part in you and the things that they discuss on your podcast are lessons that everyday person could could embrace and learn from. And I think that's that's what makes it so uh, in in people get involved in it. You're, you're listening to these people that you that you respect and that they're, they're famous and they're the, the best in their game. And um if, if people could listen to that and have takeaways. And, that, and I think that's where the big spark is with, with uh, your podcast. Oh, well, thanks. You know, fame is not the, my top priority. It's, are they a creative person? Do they have a creative discipline? It, so it happens they are though. <laughs> well, some of them are, yeah, yeah, no doubt. But it's interesting. It's very eclectic guest list. So yeah. sometimes you go, I never heard of that person. Oh, they're working into artificial intelligence or this person does this strange thing. And I kind of get excited the less I know about a person because there's so much, aha, uh -huh. it's sort of being introduced at a cocktail yep. party to somebody go, hey, this is my cool friend. The guy I mentioned about the dinosaurs, his name's Gary Staub. And he's a paleo artist. And so he works in this medium, a 52 foot shark that he's making or a mammoth that he's putting into a science and history museum. And I don't know the first thing about any of it. I just thought they dug him up and stuck him on a pedestal. But this guy goes to the dig, makes molds of the bones, makes all the parts to the dinosaur, puts the skin on it. You know, they do, they do everything. And I think, wow, what a life this guy's lived. You know, when I go to his website, 
before I talk to him, I, I'm like, it's like being an eight year old on a field trip. I was like, Oh, this is so much crazy, curious stuff here. Um, but, but the idea of whether you, uh, feel like you have some kind of a, that you're a fraud, all of those things doesn't matter if you're a songwriter or a playwright or a speaker or somebody along the way, even a life coach questions their own life. Do you know what I mean? Like there's, oh, yeah. there's parts about that that is totally transferable. And when you talk about the regular person, to me, the highest compliment in the um, in the reviews on Apple Podcasts and things are people who say, I didn't think I was a creative person, but listening to this, I realized that I do a lot of things creatively, even in my business or as an accountant. That's my point. Yes. Yeah. And they, yeah. but they feel like they found a tribe because maybe their family doesn't support their creativity, or maybe they gave up something. They played the guitar or they were a poet when they were younger and they thought this is frivolous. And they realized, Oh, I can do that as well. I can make an appointment with myself on the weekend and write a song. And I'll tell you what, nothing expressing yourself is the greatest thing you can do in whatever oh, form that expression comes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I do what I do. Uh, so you have something within you and, and you, you have to let it out. And, and when you're letting it out, knowing that somehow you're a spark that might be able to ignite change in someone's life, uh, that just puts it in a totally different perspective. And, you know, at the, at the end of the show, you just walk away and say, well, you know what? You just feel this release of, I let it out that yeah. stuff that's in you you're letting it out and it's so important but not to mention we're entertainers so you have to let it out and today i've always said we live in the united states of entertainment right and, and right. yeah yeah but and it is like, interesting too that sometimes people reserve they hold it back they want to save their creativity for you know when they go to the group meeting or whatever reason and yeah. and i think uh, maya angelou said that you can't use up creativity you know the more you use the more you have so the idea is take the risks, express yourself in this creative way. You know, it's there's so many different approaches or, or definitions of that. You know, Steve Jobs just said that creativity was connecting things. That That's all he saw it as a way of connecting things, right? And Einstein talked about creativity um, is just intelligence having fun. So it, that aspect of fun is, is where the joy comes in the smallest thing. I know that your associate Kellen makes cards. She sent me a, a card that wowed and it, you know, I can tell she spent a lot of time on it, but it came and it surprised us. And it was sort of one of our earliest pieces of fan art where she broke down all the pieces of this logo and floated them on a card. And you know, there's that, that is a gift, not just the present that you receive, but the idea that somebody has invested or showed enthusiasm in what you do. That's, it feels like it's great for the, for the, the maker and the taker in some ways, you know? Yeah. And, and you said the right word, you see, fun. And, and that's what it's about. Cause I knew what the, what this segment was going to be about this particular show, you know, about enjoying the process and igniting that passion and enthusiasm, which is why I, I, I'm glad you're, you were on the show and you're able to say, yes, and you can do it. Um, so, so you agree then that it's a, a big spark to release your creativity is to really enjoy the process. Yeah. And I also, the process is the thing, you know, yeah. it, 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 because in the end, the final result or the final painting or the final book sits on the shelf and it's great to have a piece of legacy, but the journey along the way, and it's sometimes struggle, right? It's a courage takes courage to face a blank page or to start a new project. But it's you, you, if you've ever written one book, the second book's just as hard right? The second album is just a tart. What you yeah. have to start to do is give yourself permission to like go along on the ride because you can't do, it's not perfect. It's about finding it in the failure. It's about finding where does the, where does the stream flow to? Like what's the natural order of this thing? I mean, you know, you can, you can crank out corporate art or some other thing in a way by the numbers. Uh, it doesn't give you the same joy as like just, diving into the deep end of the pool and, and learning as you go. Yeah. Um, that, that to me is what every, every step of playwriting or podcasting or whatever was just making a commitment, just saying, all right, this is a learning curve. We're not, we're going to suck in the beginning. We'll learn as we go. We'll start to enjoy it. We'll get better at it. 
And then maybe we can figure out what it is. What, you know, I'm 25 episodes in, which I think is still fairly young in the world of podcasting, but, but it's clearer and clearer to me every time I do one, what it's about and why I'm doing it and what they have to offer. And people are asking to be on because they have something to share. And so it's, I guess we're just getting closer to the bullseye with every episode. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm so glad that you agree with that. It, it, it's the journey towards the goal. It's, it's the process and, and it's your choice as to whether you want to enjoy it or not. But the thing is, Pat, I find people because of what I do, I'm so, I'm so in tune with people. Uh, I'll give you an example. There was, I was at my favorite Italian restaurant a few days ago. Uh, I'll give it a plug, Francesco's. It's a great place. And I, and I have some, I've gotten to know some people there who are, who are considered friends and the person's talking to me that they're moving into their new house and they're complaining about everything. And then the, the, the closing line was, I just can't wait. I'll be happy when the whole process of moving the furniture in is over with, and then I can enjoy the house. And I'm going, are you serious? Did you hear what you just said? Yeah. The, the the process towards the house, that journey towards the house of moving the furniture in is where you should be enjoying your life. You're telling yourself that you're not going to be happy until it's exactly the way that you want. Right. But I think my uh, analogy is that people approach it like they're cr cracking a safe, right? They want to get all the combination just right. Once I get a good relationship, good once I find the right job, once I, and they think the tumblers are all going to drop in and they're going to open it. There's going to be a big pot of happiness in there. And, you know, I'm here to tell you that no matter what happens to you every day, whether you're having a divorce or you're changing something or your job gets lost, it's your choice. Your attitude and your mindset is to, to be happy along the way until it happens. And, you know, I, I put a, a, a phrase in a, a musical that I wrote, which was called grounded for life about a guy being stuck in his bedroom his whole life. And, um, really the upshot of it, when he had a, he had an exchange with death, death ended up in a cloud of smoke coming into the room. And he asked death what the key to happiness was. And death, death says it's good news, bad news. Uh, the bad news is that there's no key to happiness, but the good news is that it's not locked. And that's <laughs> the thing is that we are the warden of our own prison, right? Yep. So I'm not saying that you can skip down the street like a lunatic. Uh, you can, it, it, if you don't care how people think of you, you can do that. But, but I am saying finding a way, whatever the terrible task of the day is, or sitting in the carpool lane or doing the, whatever it is, find the joy in the moment. It's if it's a very simple philosophy, yep. but I just I just don't think happiness is waiting around the corner. Typically, people chase happiness, which it it it's it's actually the closer you get to home is where happiness is. Right, internally looking inward and saying, "What can I enjoy about this moment or this conversation or this person?" That that's everything. Yep. Cause it's yep. not about money. It's in the end of your life when you know, barely you're hanging on to the last part of your health. It's just those people around you, which give you a certain amount of uh, joy and happiness. So why are you pushing them away to chase all this other stuff? Right? Yep. Yeah. Well, it's like the, the United States constitution, you know, the pursuit of happiness. Maybe it should be the happiness of the pursuit. Ah, yeah, I like you that. Know. Yeah, you that's know, a good one. And, and, and that's, and, and, and it, a lot of people don't get that. And a lot of people say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. And I'm saying, yeah, but you, if you keep focusing on what it is that you, you're going through, you, you don't stand a chance at happiness. And it's not a Pollyanna point of view. It's no, you know what you're saying? What you're saying is reactive yeah. versus proactive, right? Yeah. So yes. people say I'm reacting. I've done it. We're all guilty of saying of this happened to me and therefore I can't do that. That's a reaction, right? But when you're proactive, when you say, I kind of like jazz music, I'm going to go to jazz club. That's proactive. Exactly. You, you, you make a choice, which, uh, which makes a change, right? Yep. But making no choice, waiting for somebody to knock on the door and tell you that, you know, you won the lottery is a losing ticket. It just doesn't get you anywhere. And yeah. I, I, we all go through what I call a personal winter. We have slumps where we're not at our A game. But in the end, if you look back at things, when you chose a new job or you dated a new person or you did something, you're usually making a choice, you yeah. know, 
And and I face I feel like in everything, are you going to build something up or are you going to tear it down, right? If we're going to do something together, is this going to be beneficial to our friendship or relationship or is it going to be detrimental? Am I going to say no? Am I going to, and that's kind of a negative and positive approach to things, but the middle, there's nothing in the middle of sitting around. Neutral doesn't do anything. We did that, right? We sheltered in place for 18 months, feeling sorry for ourselves in some ways. And we staved off a little bit of it with, with binge watching television and doing other things. But at some point you decided, oh, I'm going to learn to cook because I'm at home more. I'm going to learn this, whatever. And I love that. I love when people are like showing pictures of their sourdough bread or their pickles as if this was some breakthrough yeah. in humanity, which the pioneers did and everyone else. But what it did was it took them off technology, gave them control of something. And yep. in the end, they have jam. And when they have jam and they can give it to their neighbor and jam makes joy, I guess that's my new, you know, fundraiser, but, but whatever it is, uh, it is interesting that it is, you mentioned the word contagious earlier. I totally believe that when people see me being proactive about making something, they go, I think I should do that. You know, that'd be fun. I, I'm going to yeah. try that, you know? Absolutely. And I don't no. know. I often don't know what I'm doing. I mean, admittedly, I just do it for the fun of it. I have, I had a, um, you know, a lot of companies have like a motto or something. And mine for a long time was fun, funny, and favorable. It seems very small and frivolous, right? But if it's not fun, I'm not going to enjoy it. Or the people who work for me aren't going to enjoy it. In my life, we're in the funny business, right? So we call ourselves your humor resources department. And it's very intentional that we're your humor resources department. It's not for me. It's for you. Like if your company needs messaging or advertising or a corporate commercial, whatever, we're going to do that. We're going to make it funny for you and memorable, right? And favorable was the key to the business side of it. If it's not favorable, if somebody's negotiating and it stinks or they treat us bad or they're not going to, you know, be friendly in it, it's just say no up front. Don't to, to be tortured and complain about it and say, these guys were paying in the ass. You knew they were a pain in the ass in that first phone call when they when they said, you know, we need to do it for half the price and deliver it tonight and whatever. It's like, no, thank you. You're calling me, right? So I yeah. don't need to, you don't need to give me the terms. It's just not favorable to us. I mean, it's an easy way to also step away from it, to say, thank you. I don't think we're a match. You know, we all want everything, but I think take the things that make your life a little bit easier, you know? Yeah, yeah. Stephen Wright said, uh, uh, you know, if, you can't have everything because where would you put it? Right. You know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, but, but, but I think that mindset of, uh, cause I hear people say, you know, uh, I, I, I'm going to a job that I don't like, or I have to face the day again. I think the mindset to enjoy yourself starts as soon as you open up your eyes to greet the day. You take your attitude when you wake up and you don't even realize it. And if you're focusing on what isn't working and all the things that are going wrong in your life, if you're focusing on the grueling day that you had the day before and all the fires that weren't put out and the irate people that you had to deal with, you will take that with you that morning. So I I suggest to people that when they wake up in the morning before they take the covers off, shift your focus and your way of thinking to what is working. Uh, to bless the things that life has given you, to, to hold on to the things that you're grateful for, and don't take the covers off until you focus on that stuff. Right. And it, it sounds like a Pollyanna point of, uh, of view, but it's so incredibly empowering because the more you do that, the more you're conditioning your subconscious that runs 97%, 97% of your life to focus on the stuff that juices you instead of the, the crap, the shit that's depleting your energy. Yeah. And, and you attract choices. you attract that energy. I'll tell you what. You, we all know when, when you have, and this happens, when the world spins in an w- axis where you get in a car wreck and then something horrible happens and then the next thing happens and then it, it, it definitely, you almost have to put yourself on a timeout during a day like that because you're going to carry that into the next thing. And I, 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 it's almost like golf, a bad golf shot. If you don't step away from it and start with a fresh golf shot, it just keeps getting worse. You end up whacking it out in the woods, right? Yeah. But, but you can't play 18 holes like that. Every time you hit a shitty shot, which happens all the time in golf, you have to be able to reposition yourself, center it and say, oh, how can I improve this? 
okay, I'm going to pick a new club. I'm going to shoot a different distance. I'm going to get it out in the fairway. I'm going to eat each putt a little bit closer, right? And you, you, you're setting out to, to succeed in some way. And I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Not just the beginning of the day. Every day is a page turn. So yep. if you have the worst day and you've been a, you know, you didn't think you did your best parenting or your best work, then commit yourself to the next day to make a better percentage out of that, you know, yeah. find a new way to do it. But I do find that it's, it, and again, this probably sounds like some kind of hallmark thing, but being in service of others is always a more rewarding thing than being in service of self, you know, which means how can I get more out of it? Isn't the same as how can I bring more to it for other people? Yeah. It just feels it's, it's just a, a, a more generous way of living. And I, 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 I find people have mentioned, uh, Eric mentions gratitude. This is the month, right? This is, we're in November and, uh, you know, Thanksgiving is a day, but really it's every day. Yeah. And, you know? and, 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 you know, and touching on that, to add to that, if you find that you are in some kind of a mood, which we all get and damn, I get in them big time. Um, uh, do something nice for somebody during the day, even the slightest thing. You ever just hold, hold, hold open a door for someone and they just look and go, thank you, or you help someone carry something, or you compliment someone, or whatever it is. Yeah. It just, it does something to this innate part of you. I, I think it's called nourishing your soul. That's what you do. And, and when you do that, you just feel better. Yeah. You know, you just feel a little bit better. And the more you do, the better you feel. And yeah. and it's just focusing on, again, what's working instead of fixating on the crap that's taking you down. And you can do it in a creative way or a funny way. I know when the, the big hoarding of the toilet paper stuff was happening last <laughs> year, I, uh, I have 28 members of my HOA here, right? So we have a big thing of mailboxes. My son and I bought 28 rolls of toilet paper. We put jelly beans in the center. We put these like bands around them. And we put them in everybody's mailbox for Easter, you know, and we wrote dumb, funny puns on the paper, you know, that said, you know, happy Easter to your keister and, you know, whatever. We wrote like a bunch of different funny things. Anyway, we did it anonymously and people were like, it was like a, we left a brick of gold in their mailbox, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, in case you get into a spot, you know, here's a little whatever. Um, and we thought it was hilarious. It was it was kind of the reverse of TPing somebody's house when you were a, a teenager, which was to give somebody that, you know, the few squares they might need on a bad day. But it made them laugh, and we, you know, we we had a good time doing it. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I get that. I get that. Why don't you, um, right now, because we're, we're we're winding down to the to the show here. Um, tell tell the people about your podcast. Who you're going to have as your next guest, and how they can get to it. And, uh, and I know folks, when you tune into his podcast, you're going to love it. You're going to get hooked on it. So just let them, let them know, Pat, how they can. Sure. Uh, I thank you for that. I, again, I'm very proud of it. I think we've had, we've had a lot of people investing time as guests, uh, tomorrow, Thursday, every Thursday, we drop a new episode. So our guest tomorrow is Kevin Nealon, who was on Saturday Night Live. But what people will discover is that he's a very good visual artist. He does characters of friends and celebrities and people who were guests on Saturday Live. And he's, he's got this great Instagram account called Kevin Neal and artwork. Uh, and you can see all of his perspective of people. Um, I talked to Jerry Seinfeld in one episode. I talked for there's comics, there's writers, there's authors, uh, Susan Stroman, who was the director and choreographer of the producers on Broadway and just cool people, rappers, um, yeah. managers. You can see some of the, the people that um, Bruce is sharing with you there. Karen Olivo was the original um, Vanessa and in, in the Heights on Broadway with Lynn manuel Miranda. And then she went on to win a Tony for West Side Story and was the star of Moulin Rouge before the pandemic. So I don't, most of these people I didn't know personally, uh, I might've worked with some people on a project and they were willing to do it, but it's gotten to be where we're talking to just as many eclectic sorts of people. It's available on all the podcasts, if you're an Apple person or Spotify or iHeart, just about anywhere, whatever they say, where the kids are getting their podcasts out of a back of a van or whatever, um, you can find it there. And then our website, which shows you the guest list, creativity and captivity dot fun has, a uh, has uh, the list, the first 25, which was season one ends this week, um, with a creative guy named Austin Cleon who wrote the book, uh, steal like an artist. And it's super, super fun 
to get this dialogue going and to learn from people. We do a little bit of curating on the conversations, but we try to stay away from politics and we try to stay away from things that are, Absolutely. you know, divisive. But but I don't have any problem talking about contemporary things. I don't mind talking about age or race or gender because that is a part of what we have to deal with. You know, the starting line is different for different people. And it's quite a, interesting to learn how somebody might come into their field that might be, you know, more based on one acceptance than another. So I feel like whatever they have to share, I have an open forum for them. And I like to amplify the voices. And I welcome anybody to, to join us uh, at Creativity and Captivity. And also, if you're a, a, if you enjoy it and you're a sharer or you're a reviewer or whatever, that stuff only helps. Yeah. Wow. I tried to find the podcast on MySpace. No, not there. Also, Eric, not available on 8-Track. I, uh, that's, those were <laughs> a couple of things I decided not to, not to do, but um, yeah, I'll send it to you if you want, that's you know, funny. I'll, I'll put it on an etch sketch and send that's it to funny. you that way. <laughs> Pat Hazel, thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for uh, taking time out to be on the show. Hey, I'm talking here. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I wish you the best. Uh, you gave some great insight to people and I, I know they enjoyed it. I'm going to get some oh, wonderful feedback. Steve so. Rizzo, I thank you so much for one shining a light on it, but also just what you do out there and, and keeping people positive and staying away from the fear of living in the shadow of the future. Uh, it's really, really important. I think that people kind of take it a day at a time. Anyway, I, I appreciate you, pal. I appreciate too, my friend. And, uh, Pat Hazel, I just want to thank you so much again for being on the show. I really, I really do appreciate it. This is the, this is where it counts, right? Just a little bit of camaraderie and a little bit of uh, cheerleading and boosting each other up as we go. Um, yep. It's fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be a guest here, even if I'm the, what do you call it, canary in the coal mine, you know? <laughs> ah, but the canary in the coal mine is hope. There you go. There, there you, go. you go. All cool. right. Well, I wish you continued success. Thank you. You too, bud. All right. You too. Cheers. All right. Thank you, you Kellen, Bruce, and everybody involved in the show. Oh, yep. she's talking here, and now she's waving here. <laughs> the new spokesperson for Bucky's gas stations all over <laughs> Texas. <laughs> so long, everyone, and thank you for watching. And please tell your friends we're on live every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you can always watch the clip on uh, Facebook and YouTube and all that other kind of stuff. But uh, thanks. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Kellen. Thank you, Bruce, for doing a great job. Love you all. And if Enjoy. you like what you see, don't forget to share and like. Oh, that was heavy. <laughs> oh, follow. <laughs> I'm not good at this. Follow Sorry. Share. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Pat. Bye, Be good. guys. See you later. Be good, man.